Erev Tov, everybody. Good evening. With Parashat Tzav and our second uh, parasha in Vayikra with the teachings of Nechama Leibowitz. We have a nice crossover uh, to last year with Rav Shai in that in Nechama's survey of comments and commentaries on the Sukim that we're going to look at, she references the one that uh, Rav Shai quotes in the passage we learned uh, from Heart of Torah last year on this same parasha, I believe, on the Shlamim. So we'll notice that and see how characteristically he sort of zeroes in on that one commentary um, to develop an idea from it, and she uses it as part of her survey of the broader view of the commentaries. Tzav is the second of really the two parashiot that focus on the system of korbanot uh, and the kind of classic description of the difference between the two is that somehow um, Tzav uh, directs itself more to the Kohanim, Vayikra more to the, the general community of Israel and the um, Korbanot that they would be bringing um, and the sort of overarching view of those Korbanot and how they more connect to the, the Baalim, the people who would be bringing them, whereas Tzav focuses in on the role of the Kohanim, the portions that they receive uh, and the like. So um, with that brief intro, let me share my screen. Okay. The peace offering, sometimes also called the fellowship offering, the shlamim. Uh, so Nechaman begins by quoting Tupsukim, uh, which really uh, introduced the second discussion of the Shlamim in chapter 7 of Vayikra. Uh, just to briefly jump over there for a moment to notice that uh, around um, Pasuk Yod Aleph, we have Zot Torah Zebach HaShlamim. This is, Tzav begins in, in chapter 6 here. In chapter 7, we have Zot Torah Zebach HaShlamim. This is the ritual of the sacrifice here, translated as the sacrifice of well-being. We get the instructions of the um, bread or cake offerings, wafer offerings that were offered along with the animal uh, and um, what goes to the priest, uh, what goes to the owners, when they, how long they can eat it. We're going to come back to some of this a little bit later uh, in Nechama's discussion. Um, uh, and that's sort of the broad discussion here. Then we get on to other discussions of impurity um, and fats that are prohibited. Uh, and then in verse 28, we circle back again to the Shlamim with Hashem speaking to Moshe saying, the two psukim she's going to quote, Daber al b'nei Yisrael le'mor, hamakriv et zebach shlamav l'adonai, yavi et korbano l'adonai mi zebach shlamav. And of course, the, the face of it, it sounds repetitive. She's going to attempt to explain to us why it's not, but speak to the children of Israel to say, the offering to God from a sacrifice of well-being must be presented by the one who offers that sacrifice of well-being to God. Sounds again, sort of redundant. And then continues, Yadav tiviena etishe Adonai, one's own hands should, prevent, should present God's offerings by fire. Uh, and the offerer presents the fat with the breast, the breast to be elevated as an elevation offering before God. And the priest then burns the fat uh, and the breast goes to Aaron and his sons and goes on to describe what... Um, uh, Professor Jacob Milgram in his uh, magisterial commentary on Vayikra and the Anchor Bible calls the priestly prebends, um, the gifts that are given to the Kohanim. So, okay, so we have two portions of chapter seven that deal with the Shlamim, and here she's introducing us to the Shlamim through the second portion. Sukim 29 and 30, he that offers his peace offering to the Lord shall bring his offering to the Lord of the sacrifice of his peace offering. His own hands shall bring the offerings of the Lord made by fire. The text of the peace offering differs stylistically from that of the other offerings. She doesn't really explain to us exactly how or why, but um, if you go through and skim, you sort of see uh, a slight differences in the presentation. Our commentators dwell on the salient points and nuances. So this is sort of a kind of broad introduction just to tell us we're going to notice what's different about the um, 
the Korban Shlamim, some of what she focuses on, I wouldn't call stylistic differences, but actual legal differences. Uh, but we're going to see at least a little bit of the stylistic differences. The following is Rav Ephraim of Lunchitz's comment in his Kliakar, or something she quotes from sometimes, not all the time. Um, and uh, always nice to get to see a Kliakar. So he writes, and this is the law of the peace offering, which he shall offer to the Lord. So actually beginning with the earlier section on the Shlamim that we saw, not where she begins her quote from. The passage dealing with the peace offering alone carries the phrase, which he shall offer to the Lord. It is the offering which is not prompted by an omission or transgression. Okay, so let's, um, we should jump back up there for a moment to see that introduction. I think she's pointing out, or the Kliakar is pointing out, um, that typically, if you hear the echoes, Zot Torah Taola, or Zot Torah Hachatat, um, here we have Zotorat Zebach Hashlamim Asher Yakriv Lahashem. Not just this is the ritual of the sacrifice of well being, but that one may offer to God. That is uh, the stylistic difference in the introduction to this Korban as opposed to others is this Asher Yakriv Lahashem. See if we can go up for a moment and see. Um, right. Zotorat Hashem. This is the ritual of the guilt offering. Kodesh Karashim Hu. Something about the offering itself. Um, or uh, going up further, if we can find another example. Zotorat Mincha, here is the ritual of the meal offering. Aaron, you know, the sons of Aaron should offer it. And yet this time we have Zot Torat Zebach Hashlamim, Asher Yakriv Lahashem, that one should offer. It sounds very generic. So the Kliakar picks up on that and says, the passage dealing with the peace offering alone carries the phrase, which he shall offer to the Lord. It is the offering which is not prompted by an omission or transgression. We're going to explain more as we go. His own hands shall bring the offerings of the Lord made by fire. That's um, Pasuk 30. It is only in regard to the peace offering that the Torah states that the owner shall bring it with his own hands. If a king's subject wishes to appease his sovereign, he sends his gift through an emissary, as did Jacob, who said, I will appease him with the present that goes before me, and afterwards I will see his face. Um, I think it's something that, and then I don't remember the end, maybe Bernie can fill it in. I don't remember exactly, but um, so I'm going to appease him with the present that goes before me. This is the beginning of Ayishlach. We remember that... Um, uh, Yaakov sends messengers to bring gifts to Esav before their encounter. Esav is not necessarily his sovereign, but someone who he wants to appease by treating him as his lord. That's, you know, part that's shot all the way through that portion is all this language of, you know, my master and bowing down, etc. But he who brings his king a gift as a token of respect does so personally with his own hands. Okay, so we have the difference between uh, an appeasement gift and a token of respect gift. Such is the difference between a sin and guilt offering due for offensive acts and the burnt offering, which brings atonement for sinful thoughts on the one hand, and the peace offering on the other. The former, that is chatat, asham, or ola, all of which are atoning for something, the former, whose purpose is to allay God's anger, should not be brought personally, for this would be presumptuous, but rather sent through the office of the Kohen. Not so the peace offering, which is a gift, that his own hands shall bring. Of course, we know that the, the person who brings the Korban Shlamim still doesn't offer it up onto the altar himself, uh, but what the Kliakar is pointing out here is both the introductory language of asher yakriv la Hashem, that one may offer to God, um, as opposed to saying, you know, that the Kohen offers or that has the status of holy of holies, whatever it is, the emphasis on that one, that, that one might bring forth to God, um, as well as the emphasis in the second portion in chapter seven that deals with the Shlamim of his own, his own hands shall bring it, uh, is somehow pointing to uh, the way in which the, the Kohen serves somehow less as an intermediary, and there's more 
of an um, attitude or orientation of unmediated um, bringing. Again, how exactly is that manifest through the ritual of the korban is less clear, um, but the framing is different. And the Kliakar is pointing out to us that that somehow mirrors the type of korban, which is an expression of gratitude or for the purpose of connection alone, uh, as opposed to because there is a wrong that needs to be righted or appeased. So that's stylistic difference number one. There are also differences between the various categories of shlamim, peace offerings. That is between the todah, thanksgiving offering, and the neder, vowed, or nedava, free will, peace offerings. So the todah is the thanksgiving, and then within the general, not thanksgiving focused, but overall peace and well-being focused, vowed or free will ones, there are differences. For the korban todah, the Torah rules. Okay, so for the Korban Toda, the Thanksgiving peace offering, the Toda um, version of the Shlamim, has to be eaten the same day it's offered and not left over till morning. Our sages explain that the sacrifice may be consumed during the following night, that is to say that night, before daybreak. There are several opinions as to the reason. Here seeming to be the reason why it can't be left any longer, not why it can. When it says here, may be consumed during the following night, it means I think the emphasis is only um, during the following night and not longer as opposed to the other uh, shlamim, which can go the next day and night. The Ralbag offers the following peculiar gastronomic motive. Okay, so we, I, I, I mean, I don't know if peculiar has a more neutral, can have a more neutral, just sort of unexpected or unusual, or if she's really commenting that she finds it strange. Um, the sacrificial meat is not to be eaten before nightfall, since it is stated thereafter, he shall not leave any of it until the morning. Rather, the time limit is the end of the night when the meat is tastier than afterwards. So the idea that um, somehow this is sort of the exact frame of time when meat tastes best, it seems, not not right away, but not too long after, sort of in the sweet spot, so to speak, uh, of the of the consumption. Maimonides, in the Guide for the Perplexed, Part 3, Section 46, adduces another reason. The offerings must all be perfect and in the best condition, in order that no one should slight the offering or treat it with contempt. Okay, so somehow we want to ensure the quality of the korban so that the korban itself is honored, right? Not the owner or the recipient, i.e. God, but somehow actually the, the, the ritual object, the cultic object, the sacrifice itself. The burnt offering was flayed. So we're speaking now more broadly about korbanot here in the Rambam. Uh, so here we have the ola, for example, and it's inwards and legs. Although they were entirely burnt, had to be previously washed in order that due respect should always be shown to the sacrifice, right? So the Raman is pointing out here, even though this is going to be totally burned, it still was well treated before that to show it respect. This object here, I think it means the object, i.e. the goal of showing respect to the Korban is constantly kept in view. I mean, this, the, the Torah and the sages keep our attention on this point and is often taught, quoting from Malachi, this notion, you say the table of the Lord is polluted and the fruit thereof, even his meat is contemptible. We want to avoid that. Now that seems to link more to God's reputation. So maybe there that is the further out pause or concern. Uh, but the way the Ramam frames it initially, it seems to be the korban itself, the, the ritual objects. Again, they certainly reflect on the tradition and the, and the commander, um, but the ritual objects themselves, almost like the idea that we have uh, on other ritual objects of hidor mitzvah, where we want to get the most beautiful lulav and etrog, the nicest, you know, nice, most nicely written Torah, things like that. Because uh, so again, it might link back to God, um, but there's a sort of a concern for the beauty of the object itself. For the same reason, nobody uncircumcised or unclean was allowed to partake of any offering nor could any offering be eaten that had become unclean or was left till after a certain time, concerning which or concerning which an illegal intention had been conceived. These are various, uh, you know, tumah, um, notar, pigul, 
various categories, disqualifying categories for a korban. And it also had to be consumed in a particular place. Of the burnt offering, which is entirely devoted to God, nothing at all was eaten. Those sacrifices which are brought for a sin, for example, sin offering and guilt offering, must be eaten within the court of the sanctuary and only on the day of their slaughtering and the night following, while peace offerings, which are next in sanctity, being sacrifices of the second degree, may be eaten in the whole of Jerusalem on the day they have been offered and on the following day, but not later. After that time, the sacrifices would become spoiled and be unfit for food. Here, vowed and free will peace offerings are meant. Okay, so we have the the um, Ral Bag who seems focused on the you know best the best window for the taste of the meat. Uh, we have the Rambam who sees you know all the uh, details of the korbanot uh, around just ensuring that they are respectable, um, and so even if they're not the perfect taste, that they not be spoiled. And now an entirely different reason is suggested by the Sefer HaChinuch. Moreover, there is in this an allusion to our trust in God. Here again, we're coming to the time period for eating. A man should not begrudge himself his food and store it for the morrow, seeing that God commanded to utterly destroy sanctified meat after its time, when no creature, man or beast, is allowed to partake of it. So somehow the um, God limits the time. And accepting that and the very setting of the limit drives us to kind of eat what we have during the time that we have it and not hold it over as a way of showing our trust in God that God will provide for us the next meal as well. So establishing this time constraint is a way of training us in what the Sefer Achinuch, here we have the English translation, but the Sefer Achinuch uh, inside in the Hebrew calls bitachon. Right. Tr trust, trust and faith in God. Okay. So that's that that's not ideal taste, not sort of respectability of the Korban itself, um, but limited time in order to encourage us to, you know, eat it for only one meal as a way of showing trust that we know God will provide the next meal. This view gains weight in the case of the Thanksgiving offering offered for a miraculous experience, right? The Korban Toda, you know, offered when um, we were rescued from something or survived a harrowing experience. Thus, it was forbidden to keep the man that came down miraculously from heaven. You may have been thinking about this parallel for the following day in order to accustom the children of Israel to trust in God. Our sages declare, he who has bread in his basket and says, what will I eat tomorrow has little faith in God. Okay, so I think when she says this view gains weight in the case of the Thanksgiving offering um, and compares it to the man, she's sort of saying the view of the Sefer Achinoch makes sense because it sort of parallels the idea of the man, uh, which was also um, miraculous and aims to uh, focus on focus us on faith and trust. So to the Korban Toda, which is a response to a miraculous experience, is there to help further cultivate our faith and trust. Abravanel considers this law in the social context. The purpose, again, here commenting on 7.11, the intro to the Shlamim. The purpose of this law of peace offering is to publicize the miracle. Seeing that he has only one day and one night for consuming his sacrifice, the owner invites his relatives and friends to share his meal and joy. On being asked what motivated this feast, the host will recount the divine wonders, right? So recognizing that any uh, meat which is left over has to be burnt. And we don't want anything to go to waste. But if you have a big animal and you only have that night to eat it, um, you're not going to be able to finish it all. So you're naturally having only one night going to reach out to more people to come and join you. Uh, and they're going to say, wow, I, we're all here enjoying this Korban Toda, you know, um, meat handout. What was the occasion? And you're going to tell the story of the miraculous experience that that drove you to offer this korban toda, and and that will further the expressions of gratitude to God. But if the time for consuming Thanksgiving peace offerings were two days in one night, as for other peace offerings, the owner would not invite anyone. For in one house shall it be eaten in two days and one night. But having an abundance of meat and bread in the house, 
and only one day, because remember it was it was bread, loaves, and wafers, as we read, that go along with it. And only one day and one night in which to eat it, he will certainly invite many friends to share it, lest they despise him the next morning when they see him burning large quantities of the residue of his offering. Right. So it's not not just that you don't you don't want to uh, you know food to go to waste, but especially you don't want to see your neighbors you know, throwing out and burning up all this meat that they could very well have been invited over to enjoy. Uh, so you'll invite them over for the meal from both of those motivations. This is our little crossover moment. Uh, those who uh, learned with uh, together Rav Shai last year will recall that on Parshat Tzav in the meaning of the Thanksgiving offering, he quotes the Abravanel's very same um, uh, explanation um, as sort of the starting point and says that, you know, that orients us in the Korban Toda um, to sort of expressing thanksgiving to God, bringing people together in order to focus everyone's direction um, in expressing the thanksgiving towards God. Then he went on from there to sort of say, like, but the ultimate expression of gratitude is sharing with others, not so much the focus on the source of the gratitude, although that's important too, uh, but that actually the, nat the the ideal response to gratitude is, so to speak, paying it forward. Uh, and so the idea of having the meal um, is, again, not just, as the Abravanel says, to focus people uh, on connecting with God, um, but to model uh, the ideal response to gratitude, which is, uh, which is sharing with others, uh, appreciating what we were given, and therefore being motivated to extend that to others. So uh, Rav Shai focuses on that Abravanel and builds out from it um, for Nechamat, you know, one of a long list, although we see that it is towards the direction of the ones that she seems to favor. Okay, almost through the uh, the range of opinions here. The Ha'amek Davar elaborates the details of the offering. Together with loaves of leavened bread shall he make his offering, this implies that the leaven loaves constitute the main purpose of the offering. It's not obvious to me exactly how sh the, the Nitziv is reading this. Together with loaves of leavened bread shall he make his offering. Somehow seems to suggest that the loaves of leavened bread are, are the essential thing. Hence the Torah adds, these to be added to his peace offering of thanksgiving, shlamav, i.e. the loaves are to be added because it is his thanksgiving peace offering. The purpose of the thanksgiving offering, wrought for a miraculous deliverance from danger, is to induce the owner to recount God's merciful deeds. Again, it sounds similar to the, um, to the Abravanel. Accordingly, whereas the loaves prescribed are several, the time limit for consuming the thanksgiving offering is the shortest, the day of the offering and the following night, shortest of all the peace offerings, whose time limit generally otherwise is two days. This is designed to increase the number of participants in the feast on the day of the offering, so that many people will learn of the miracle, and there will be four loaves for the priests. Hence, the leavened loaves constitute the principal part of the meal, for matzah, the bread of poverty, is not as digestible as leavened bread. Okay, So specifically, the leavened loaves are the essential part. The end of this verse teaches that the leavened loaves are the essence because it is the peace offering of his thanksgiving and gratitude for emerging from an adversity and regaining his well-being. So we have more emphasis here on the bread part um, as central and maybe maybe around the idea that focusing on the feast because sort of bread is, I mean, even though meat is obviously an important part of a feast, bread is sort of the, the essential staple or building block. This also explains the repetition at the end of verse 13, that the bread is to be added to his peace offering of thanksgiving, already stated in verse 12. I was just looking there for a moment. Right, one who offers it for thanksgiving shall offer together with the sacrifice of thanksgiving, these unleavened cakes, unleavened wafers, and cakes of choice flour with oil mixed in. This offering, with cakes of leavened bread added, shall be offered along with one sacrifice, thanksgiving sacrifice of well-being. Somehow the focus on repeating along with the bread and shlamav, zevach todat shlamav, his 
Thanksgiving offering highlights the role of the bread in the Thanksgiving. That seems to be the essential uh, addition or point of the nitziv. And she goes on to say, it further sheds light on Psalm 116, verses 17 to 19, as explained in this author's commentary, Harchev Davar, that's the, the Nitziv's uh, expansions uh, on his basic commentary, which says, The psalmist declares, I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all God's people, in the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. We may recognize the Hebrew of this from Hallel. Lecha is bach zevach toda, from the Ma'ashiv paragraph. Uveshem Adonai akra, nidarai la Adonai ashalem, negda na lachol amo, vechatzrot beit Adonai, betochechi Yerushalayim, hallelujah. Already feels, I feel like the Seder night. Um, okay, why is he to pay his vows in the presence of all God's people? The Nitziv asks further. How does this enhance the act? Surely God requires to walk humbly with your God. So the notion that the zevach toda is somehow done in this public space seems to kind of fly in the face of the general ethic of privacy, modesty um, that we have. The answer provided herein is that sharing the meal of the Thanksgiving offering with numerous guests will serve as an occasion for the public acknowledgement of God's providential loving kindness. So we would generally offer our sacrifices. Again, obviously it can't be in, they're going to be at the Beit HaMikdash, so the Kohen is going to know about it. Um, but we, we generally don't think about offering our offerings or experiencing them in the presence of all God's people. Why specifically is the Todah in the presence of all God's people? Because the limited time, getting going back to the Abravanel and the Nitziv's own explanation, the limited time window to eat will mean that more people will come together and we will acknowledge God in explaining why we have, you know, offered this offering. Um, and therefore, that's done in the presence of all God's people. This law, which reduces the time allowed to consume an increased quantity of loaves and cakes, thus enhances the divine miracle, as well as neighborly love and human brotherhood. It fully justifies the term shlamim, as interpreted by Rabbi Yehuda, he who offers shlamim, peace offering, brings shalom, peace, into the world. Uh, so um, I'll let that digest while I pause for a moment and come back shortly. I'm back. I have told everybody again. And um, that's the conclusion of the essay. So happy for any thoughts anyone wants to share on, um, again, summarizing uh, the, I think, two central points that she's introducing to us through the commentaries about the stylistic and legal differences of the Shlamim. Uh, the first that, as opposed to all other Korbanot, uh, this is not um, attempting to right a wrong or uh, appease for a sin, um, but is more, it's, I wouldn't say it's necessarily more about getting close. The other ones are also about getting close, uh, but it has more of a dimension of not clouded by anything that needs repair um, and more just affirming in a positive sense 
uh, gratitude, respect, etc. And so there's something um, more unmediated, direct, um, that's symbolized by the language of, uh, you know, his own hands shall bring it. The Zot Torat, Sabah Hashlamim Asher Yakriv Hashem, that the bringer brings straight to God again, even though the Kohen is involved. Um, the fact that the this is the this is the one which the bringer does get to eat some of, so they're a more active player in the whole in the, in in from start to finish, we could say. Uh, and then the second half for the bulk of it, uh, the question of why um, the korban toda in particular was eaten for a shorter period of time, either the ideal window for consumption, which is a more of a focus somehow on the owners of the korban and and giving the most, the best experience to them, then the Rambam, which again, obviously links to God, but focuses on the Korban object itself and the desire for that to be aesthetic and sort of um, ritually perfect. Um, so not wanting it to spoil. Uh, and then the third opinion reflected by the Abravanel uh, and the Nitziv, uh, that this is the shorter time window is to encourage more people to come together and share. Uh, and this, um, this helps uh, express gratitude to God, which is the goal of the offering. Of course, I jumped over the Sefer HaChinuch, um, who emphasizes the short time window, maybe the most interesting one, the short time window uh, of this Korban, uh, which is coming to express gratitude for something miraculous, kind of... Um, deepens that by helping us work on our attitude of trust and faith by sort of saying, have the experience of having food, which you can only have for a limited time, um, as a way of showing the trust, not leaving anything over or feeling the need to save, but rather trusting that the, the next meal will come as well. So range of different opinions, again, not none of them contradictory or mutually exclusive, uh, but help us see different dimensions of what this korban is aiming to do with its unique language and and unique laws. Questions, comments on the shlamim. Or insights from our wonderful group. Lance, kick it off. What is hit bodidut? As a priest, of course. <clears throat> Thanks. What is hit bodidut? Hit bodidut. I have no idea how this is going to connect. I can't wait to find out. Hit bodidut. Uh, um, hit bodidut is, uh, is a relationship that you have with God, but it's private. Yes. Right? Yes. I think it, I, I typically think of it as specifically referring, well, I guess there's different, uh, in different eras may have meant different things, but uh, yeah, introspective, private sort of God connection. Yeah, good. Right. So I would suggest that the deep structure here is Hippodidu. In other words, the peace offering um, is an offering of nearness, or the idea is to get close to God. And um, it seems to me that all this stuff about the sacrifices and all, those other, all these other things are really about the Christian concept of sin and grace. Sin is separation. Grace is nearness. And um, it seems to me that in Judaism, it's uh, originally, of course, the same thing. And if you think about um, the relationship between Elisha and God, the relationship between um, uh, Joseph and God, uh, between Abraham and God, I mean, there's a close, tight relationship here that has nothing to do really with sacrifice. I mean, yeah, sacrifices are involved, but um, it seems to me that uh, you're going to hate me for this, but... <laughs> But what I see here is what I call the Corbin libel. In other words, um, the priest is seen as a person who uh, basically, um, you know, cooks, sautés, has a little supermarket in Jerusalem. Um, you know, it's uh, it's kind of, in a way, uh, from my point of view, Jewish anti-Semitism. But um, the point here is not about that. The point here is that each and every one of us can achieve nearness to God. In fact, Paul Tillich in his Shaking the Foundations says that God is closer to you than you are to yourself. And it seems to me that the sensitivity to what's going on around the world, and my God, 
I can't even begin to think about it right now. But um, the question is, can you sense in yourself um, a nearness to God? And that's, I think, what's, I, I, I really think that um, the, the business of walking humbly with God says it right there in the middle of the uh, essay. How do you do that? How do you walk humbly with your God? Mm. Not by burning uh, lambs, right? Okay. Uh, good challenge or critique to the sacrificial system. And uh, it's interesting. As to... the Kohen system, by the way. Yes. yes. My other reaction is interesting to think about the idea of he'd both do it here, especially against the backdrop of kind of the suggestion that the goal of the Korban Toda is to create community. Um, so I'm, it makes me think just a little bit about kind of, you know, what is the experience of the person who is who who is bringing the Thanksgiving offering, has brought all these people together and is recounting God's wonders in this context, sort of, it it's a much different expression of gratitude than what the private one might be. So it's interesting to me as well. Thank you. Wouldn't that be like the Purim Suda? I mean, yeah, in a sense, especially because, um, right, for the Purim Suda is, it's a, you know, it is a, a Suda Toda'a expression of gratitude and thanksgiving, but whereas the Purim Suda is uh, everyone in some way, we un, we imagine experience the same salvation or we are we are celebrating the same deliverance collectively, Whereas the korban toda is people, we we have this nowadays also, where people have a an experience of you know uh, being rescued or saved or healed or whatever, and they have a suda toda, a Thanksgiving, um, you know, meal, and they invite people to share in it with them. Um, and it's just interesting to imagine what that experience is like when you're the only one who experienced the actual deliverance, and you're having people kind of come and celebrate with you. Does it sort of is highlight the closeness or the or kind of the difference in the experiences of the people in the rooms? The uh, uh, and the uh, slight analogy in my mind is not on the level of Thanksgiving per se, but uh, is like um, when we all show up on uh, erev Pesach for the siyum. Well, one person learned a whole tractate and they're making a siyum, and we just sort of come and listen to the end, and then we get to break our fast. Um, you know, but there's you know, it's only one person's experience. We're all just sort of tagging along to. So, excellent, yeah. excellent. Other questions or comments, Bernie? Please go ahead and unmute. Uh, there is also the Birkara Gomil. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's sort of our modern liturgical expression of Thanksgiving, um, based in many ways on, I think, on the framework of the Korban Toda, um, and uh, yeah, and it's a sim similar type of thing. Everybody, you know. Everyone has to answer Amen and express this blessing back. It creates sort of more of a point of connection in a way, but I guess it's like partake, it's a, akin to partaking in the Su'uda, but there's an even more strong kind of feedback loop um, when we answer, yes, the God who showed you goodness, may that God always show you goodness. It's interesting that the response isn't, may the God who showed you goodness also show us goodness, right? But we actually you know, reflect back to the person who is expressing the thanksgiving that they should continue to have things to be thankful for. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it's a it's a good analog. I don't know if there's anything kind of drawn out about the, um, you know, differently, of course, than the Korban Toda, we have a much wider time window for when the Birkat HaGomel should be uh, recited. Um, so interesting to think about that similarity or difference. But, but also... Um, when a person uh, comes and publicly recites Birkata Gomel, it's also an opportunity for people to ask that person, what happened? Why are you doing this? And and again, just like we have with the Korban, the quote-unquote miracle gets uh, of God's gets spread. Yeah, excellent. Another great, uh, great um, point of continuity between the Korban Toda short window leading to the feast that enables the sharing uh, and the Birkat HaGomel moment in community enabling the, enabling the sharing. It's interesting that they, I don't, I don't know exactly whether we're attentive to this nowadays. The Gemara talks about the idea that within the Minyan of the Birkat HaGomel, um, there are supposed to be at least one or two Zekenim or Chachamim 
Um, I don't know whether we just sort of assume that and incorporate it or whether we don't formally posk in that way and whether there's any that draws any parallel to the um, to the Korban Toda. That's a, a point to look into further. So exactly. good, good connection to the Seder. And yes, everyone has to do it. We all are. Or even if we all were or we all are. Yeah. Great. Other comments? Okay. Uh, well, toda then. Thanks everybody for wonderful learning and uh, look forward to continuing next week. Good rest of the night. Love to mom and dad. Toda Bye.